Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Supremely Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Supremely Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Supremely Enlightened One. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Namunda. So today I wanted to teach everyone another discourse of the Buddha. And tomorrow, as I understand, is the uh, Poya program, the full moon day program, right? So I think this, this course that I've chose matches well with that. So when you, when you participate in the Poya program, the full moon day program, you're observing higher precepts, right? You observe the eight precepts. So how many of you do that at least once a month? Everyone? So that's very important. Uh, the Buddha praised that very highly. At least once a month to observe the Uposata, participate in the Poya day by observing the eight precepts. And you can devote that day toward study of the Dhamma, practice of the Dhamma, and meditation, right? So now the culture is very different than it was in ancient India. So we do the programs on a weekend, right? But the, the main point is to practice as the Buddha instructed. So we can think too, there are different levels of sila, virtue, that the Buddha taught. So for a layman or a laywoman, right, the basic foundation of virtue is the five precepts, right? So I think all of you keep the five precepts regularly, right? And then on full moon days, the Buddha advised to keep the eight precepts. And when you look at the eight precepts, the difference between the five precepts and the eight precepts, you're distancing yourself more from sensuality, right? From sensual pleasures. So that's important as, as a lay person who is living in a home and engaging with many duties or a lay person who is um, working full time as a family. It's important when practicing the Buddha's teaching to at least once a month to be able to distance oneself to practice distancing oneself from sensual pleasures. Now, that's important for several reasons. One reason is to progress deeply in meditation is necessary to, at some point or another, let go of sensual pleasures. Right, so maybe some of you remember um, when the Buddha explains the first jhana, first stage of meditative absorption, profound state of concentration, samadhi. Buddha explains, vivicceva kamehi, vivicca kusalehi dhammehi. So secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. So a person has to withdraw the mind from the five objects of sensual pleasure, forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches. So it's an important practice to be able to do that. And then for a novice monk, for example, novice monk has 10 precepts. So he has also given up the use of money. And then a monk who's fully ordained, and there's a big difference in the virtue of a fully ordained monk. A uh, fully ordained monk in, in general practices 227 precepts and then many other smaller minor precepts related to those. So in the Buddha's dispensation, various levels of virtue, right? 
Now, let me ask everyone, what is the purpose of the precepts the Buddha has taught? What is the purpose of virtue? Let me try. I think the virtue is the very foundation of everything, like to attaining concentration, um, etc. Like <laughs> it's, it's the very foundation of everything, Monday. That's what hmm. I think. Anyone else? Monday, I think it's uh, Bhante, I think it's to remove or to start to remove attachment or start to separate ourselves from attachment. Okay. Any Bhante, other answer? Bhante, Bhante? Like the virtue is essential for especially the noble way for that, like speech, right action, that helps to develop to the Yes. I think mm -hmm. Prasad also. <laughs> There are 10 according to the Pali Sutras or not. Uh, but I can tell one one of that, you know, uh, it's a Dita Dhamma, Asava, Sangvaraya, and uh, then Samprayaka, Asava, Patikhataya. So that's, that's mm. the most really one for me. That's why this one's such nice. You're mentioning the the 10 reasons why the Buddha laid down precepts, right? Yeah, in the Pali Sutras or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's. When the Buddha lays down a precept for the monks, he explained there are 10 reasons for doing so. So I think everyone gave good answers. Now, two, two answers that I remember that I wanted to remind everyone about. So one, one reason why you practice virtue, like the end result we can, we can kind of say, is to remove remorse. You understand that? So do you know what, can anyone tell me what remorse is to start with? Can anyone explain that state of mind? Or regret, if we say another synonym? Oh, sorry, Bhante. I think it's when we do something wrong and we kept thinking about it and we, are, we feel very regretful about it. And mm -hmm. it's always in our mind. Yes, yeah, so when we do something wrong, we have regret or remorse over what we did. Now, remorse can also arise in another way. It's maybe a bit more subtle. If we fail to do something good, you understand? So maybe tomorrow there's the opposite of the program, the Poi Day program. So maybe someone is lazy tomorrow and they don't want to, um, they're just laying in bed and, and enjoying relaxation during the day and they don't participate. They wanted to initially, right? But later on, they feel regret about that and they, oh, I was unable to participate in the program as, as a shame for me. So they didn't do anything wrong per se, right? But they failed to do something good. So those are two ways that remorse can arise. Now remorse is one of the five hindrances right, that cover the mind, the defilement of the mind, and weakens wisdom, prevents us from seeing things as they really are, prevents us from seeing the reality as it really is. So these are obstacles to development of the mind, obstacles to meditation. So by practicing virtue, think, so we are purifying our actions, right, in virtue, if we do nothing wrong, then how could remorse arise? Right? We have no reason to criticize ourselves by body or speech if we completely purified our actions, right? So by doing that, a happiness arises in the mind. Buddha called it anavajja sukha. Vajja is something that's blameworthy. Anavajya sukha is a blameless happiness, a happiness that comes from doing nothing wrong. So maybe you can remember too, one subject of meditation is to reflect on one's virtue. 
So if you're practicing the five precepts purely, you can reflect on that in various ways. How special that is, how you don't harm any other being by protecting those precepts, right? It's for your own benefit and the benefit of everyone else. So you can reflect on that and a happiness should arise in the mind. And that happiness is a support for meditation. Because meditation, as I think everyone probably understands, meditation doesn't happen the way we might wish it to. Right? The meditation, developing the mind, happens because of causes and conditions. So we have to develop the correct causes in the mind for meditation to proceed properly. So one of the first, the first cause for de developing samadhi, we can say, is a gladness in the mind. Pamunja, the Pali word. And that gladness arises from the wholesome, from wholesome states. Now, a person can also gain happiness by uh, enjoying forms, enjoying music, uh, using perfumes, tasting delicious food, and uh, feeling nice tactile objects. That's also kind of happiness, right? But that happiness doesn't lead to developing wholesome states. That's one big difference. So that happiness conduces to developing states of greed, right? But there is a happiness there. But for example, in meditation, you're developing a happiness, like a spiritual happiness, that's not connected with sensual pleasure, not connected with unwholesome states. You understand the difference? So a gladness in the mind produced from virtue, developing wholesome states, conduces to developing meditation. Another reason why we practice virtue is to serve as a foundation for practicing the four establishments of mindfulness. So to really practice right mindfulness in the Noble Eightfold Path, we have to base ourselves on virtue first. That's why we say sila samadhi panya, virtue, concentration, wisdom. Right, so virtue is the foundation for samadhi, for developing mindfulness. So with that uh, brief introduction, I think we can start the discourse. There are a lot of interesting things to discuss here. The discourse I chose for today is Majjhimanikai number 66, Latuki Kopama Sutta, the simile of the quail. If someone could send out a link to that, I'm using Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Now, a quail is a tiny bird, for some of you who don't know, maybe. So the Buddha explains this discourse using a simile related to this tiny bird. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the country of the Anguttarapans, where there was a town of theirs named Apana. Then, when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Apana for alms. When he had wandered for alms in Apana and had returned from his alms round, after his meal he went to a certain grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. And when it was morning, the Venerable Udayin, dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he too went into the town of Apana for alms. When he had wandered for alms in Apana and had returned from his alms round, after his meal he went to that same grove for the day's abiding, where the Buddha was staying. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. Now see how Venerable Udayan starts to think. Then, while the Venerable Udayin was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in his mind. How many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? 
How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? So he's thinking, this is wise consideration, right? And he's thinking thoughts of gratitude, actually, on what the Buddha has done for him. Then, when it was evening, the Venerable Dain rose from meditation, went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and told him, Dear Venerable Sir, while I was alone in meditation, following thought arose in my mind, and he explains the same thing that he thought before. Venerable Sir, formerly, we used to eat in the evening, in the morning, and during the day, outside the proper time. So there was a time in the Buddha's dispensation when the monks could eat three meals a day. They could eat in the morning, in the afternoon, and night if they wished. Then there was an occasion when the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, please abandon that daytime meal, which is outside the proper time. Let's say like three o'clock in the afternoon. Venerable Sir, I was upset and sad, thinking faithful householders give us good food of various kinds during the day outside the proper time. Yet the Blessed One tells us to abandon it. The Sublime One tells us to relinquish it. Out of our love and respect for the Blessed One, and out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandon that daytime meal, which was outside the proper time. So notice what happened here. The Buddha is advising the monks, do this. Abandon that meal. Give that up. Now, for the monks, this wasn't easy to do. He says, so Venerable Udain was upset and sad when the Buddha gave this advice. So for us too, the Buddha can teach us to practice something. I think we explained maybe like two weeks ago, I explained, in some discourses you find where the Buddha gives direct advice to his disciples. Evang Sikkitabha. Thus should you train, you should practice in this way. So we should pay very close attention to that advice because the Buddha is directly telling us what we should practice. So for the monks, the Buddha has laid down various precepts, like I explained. So there are more than five for the monks. For high ordained monks, there are over 200 precepts to keep regularly. So some of those can be very difficult to keep, actually, because of one's own defilements. It can be difficult to keep. But, so the Venerable Udayan explains, out of our love and respect for the Blessed One, and out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandon that daytime meal, which was outside the proper time. So because the Venerable Udayan has respect for the Buddha as his teacher, he followed the Buddha's advice. Now, what do you think? If you, if you don't respect the Buddha, if you don't have faith in the Buddha, are you going to follow his advice? No, Bhante. No, right? No, so, Bhante. one of the causes, one of the basic causes we need to establish in ourselves is faith, confidence, trust in the Buddha. Otherwise, we won't be able to practice his teachings, honestly. Do you understand? So I think that happens to a lot of Western people is that they don't have that like basic element of faith in the Buddha. Faith in the Buddha means to believe in his enlightenment. The Buddha was a fully enlightened being. He had such and such qualities, the nine qualities of the Buddha. So to believe in that is to have faith in the Buddha. Without that faith, we can't develop further because we have really, because a person doesn't have a reason to practice the Buddha's teachings. Yet. So for many Western people, Buddhism can become simply just a, a means to like, calm down the mind and remove stress, but they don't really get the deeper benefits from the Buddha's teachings. 
maybe they might not practice virtue, right? So I remember a, a man came to Sri Lanka to practice meditation. He came to one of the monasteries here and I was teaching him the Dhamma and meditation. And before he left, he observed three of the five precepts, not all five, <laughs> he observed three of them, which is better than none, of course, right? That's, that's a development. Um, but so he didn't, he didn't have enough faith to observe all five. Right, that's the reason. Now, the Buddha explained too, so for a faithful disciple who wants to gain results from the Buddha's teaching, who wants to realize the Dhamma, for example, it should think in this way. The Buddha knows. The Buddha knows the Dhamma. The Buddha knows about my life. The Buddha knows everything. I don't know. You're thinking in a humble way, right? The Buddha knows what is good for me, what is bad for me. I don't know these things. By learning from the Buddha that I know. The Buddha is the teacher of the Dhamma. I am a disciple. Right? So you should think in that mindset. Satthami Bhante Bhagava Savako Hamasya. The Blessed One is the teacher. I am a disciple. So thinking in that humble way, one gains the opportunity to follow the Buddha's advice, right? So if children are disrespectful, disobedient to their parents, why? Because they don't trust their parents' advice, right? And their parents advise them to do something. You know, I don't need to do that. Maybe what, do, what do they know, right? So then why are they thinking in that way? So they don't actually trust the advice of their parents. Let their parents know what is good for them, what is bad for them. So then the Venerable Udayan says, then we ate only in the evening and in the morning. Then there was an occasion when the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, monks, please abandon that night meal, which is outside the proper time. Venerable Sir, I was upset and sad, thinking, the Blessed One tells us to abandon the more sumptuous of our two meals. The Sublime One tells us to relinquish it. Once, Venerable Sir, a certain man had obtained some soup during the day, and he said, put that aside, and we will all eat it together in the evening. Nearly all dishes are prepared at night, few by day. Out of our love and respect for the Blessed One, and out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandoned that night meal, which was outside the proper time. So the day after tomorrow, when you're uh, observing the eight precepts, you'll abstain from eating after noon, right? Now, we should practice this with faith in the Buddha. This may be difficult for us to do, may be unpleasant for us to do. But when we are practicing the Dhamma, you see, gradual practice gradually trying to tame the mind. So our minds have many faults. We have many bad qualities in our mind, all of us. So even monks, all monks who aren't arahants have some faults in their mind. So it's by practicing the Dhamma that we gradually remove those faults. Anupubbe davi tokatokan kanekini the wise person, step by step, moment by moment, kamaro rajata seva nindana like a smith who is purifying silver, removing the dross from the silver metal. Moment by moment, step by step, we should try to remove our own impurities of the mind. It has happened, venerable sir that monks wandering for alms in the thick darkness of the night, remember those days there weren't any electric lights. The monks are wandering in the darkness. They have walked into a cesspool, fallen into a sewer, walked into a thorn bush, walked into a sleeping cow. They have met hoodlums 
who have already committed a crime and those planning one. He thieves at night, in the middle of the night. And they have been sexually enticed by women. Once, venerable sir, I went wandering for alms in the thick darkness of the night. A woman washing a pot saw me by a flash of lightning and screamed out in terror, Mercy me, a devil has come for me. I told her, Sister, I am no devil. I am a monk waiting for alms. Then it's a monk whose ma's died and whose pa's died. Better, monk, that you get your belly cut open with a sharp butcher's knife than this prowling for alms for your belly's sake in the thick darkness of the night. Notice how the woman responded. Notice how she criticized Monk, right? He cursed him, right? So one of the reasons, Prasad explained two reasons that the Buddha uh, institutes precepts for monks. Another reason is for those who don't have confidence to gain confidence in the Buddha's teaching. So for this woman who sees Venerable Udayan behaving in this way, does she have confidence in the Sangha? Does his behavior conduce to confidence in the Sangha? No, right? No. So it's, it's a suffering for her, actually, what, what he is doing. Then, when the Venerable Udayan was thinking about this, when he recollected that, he thought, how many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One, how many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? So by not going for alms at night, they avoid all of those problems, right? The monks avoid all of those problems that they encounter by going for alms at night by not going simply. So it may be difficult to abandon that, but when the Buddha says to do it, there's a reason behind that. And it actually leads to the happiness of the monk. Now, I remember when the Buddha was giving advice to abstain from eating at night. The Buddha explained in Kita Giri Sutta, the Buddha explained, Monks, I abstain from eating at night. By so doing, I am free from illness and affliction. And I enjoy lightness, strength, and a comfortable abiding. Come, monks, abstain from eating at night. By so doing, you too will be free from illness and affliction, and you will enjoy lightness, strength, and a comfortable abiding. So this is the result of abstaining from eating at night. So the day after tomorrow, these are the results that you can expect by practicing that precept. Then the Buddha says, so too, dying, there are certain misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this. They say, what, such a mere trifle? Such a little thing as this? This recluse is much too exacting, and they do not abandon that, and they show discourtesy towards me, as well as towards those monks desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. So the Buddha gives advice to abandon some kind of behavior. We're thinking about virtue, for example the precepts of a monk. But the monks, when they hear this, they think, oh, that's such a very small thing, a tiny thing. Why, why can't we eat at night? That's not a big issue. So they think in that way, and that small thing becomes for them a strong bondage in the mind. The Buddha says to practice in such a way, and they don't accept the Buddha's words. Why? Because they consider what the Buddha is telling them. They consider it something very minor. But that's not the way we should think, actually. 
So the Buddha teaches us to refrain from lying. A person can think, um, white lie, what's, what's the problem with a little white lie? And they are disrespectful for the Buddha, toward the Buddha, and they don't want to abstain from lying. Right? A person can think in that way, but it's important, like I said before, to accept the Buddha's words humbly. And the Buddha gives the simile that gives its name to the discourse. Suppose, Udayin, a quail were tethered by a rotting creeper and would there expect injury, captivity, or death. Now suppose someone said, the rotting creeper by which that quail is tethered and thereby expects injury, captivity, or death is for her a feeble, weak, rotting, coreless tether. Would he be speaking rightly? No, Venerable Sir. For that quail, the rotting creeper, so it's, it's not even, uh, maybe it's dead. The creeper, the vine, isn't even alive anymore. It's brown, wilted. But that quail is bound by that and expects injury, captivity, or death because of that creeper. So for the quail, actually, even though it's a very minor thing, it's a very tiny vine, weak vine, but for the quail, it's a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. Why? Because the quail is a weak animal. You understand? So even though the, the bondage is a weak one, it's a rotten creeper, a rotten vine, but because the quail is a tiny, weak bird, it can't break that. So the Buddha is explaining, so a certain kind of person, they have a weak mind. And even a small thing becomes a fetter for them, becomes a bond for them. And the Buddha explains this more in detail. We'll understand more when we go on. So too, dying, there are certain misguided men here who when told by me abandon this, they say, what, such a mere trifle, such a little thing as this? This recluse is much too exacting. And they don't abandon what the Buddha tells them to abandon. They show discourtesy toward the Buddha, as well as toward those monks who desire to train in the precepts. And for them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. But there are other monks who, when the Buddha tells them to abandon something, they think, what, such a tiny thing, such a little thing like this? The Buddha tells them to abandon that. The sublime one tells them to relinquish it. So even though they think it's a small thing, they follow the Buddha's advice and they abandon it. They don't show disrespect for the Buddha or the other monks who desire to practice the teachings. And having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with mind as aloof as a wild deer's. For them, that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, coreless tether. So do you understand the gist of the simile? It might be difficult to grasp at once what the Buddha is trying to say. Now, the next, the next paragraph will make it clear, I think. Suppose you dine a royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles, full grown in stature, high bred and accustomed to battle. This is a, maybe a king's elephant who goes to war for the king, very strong, huge animal. So you were tethered by stout leather thongs but by simply twisting his body a little, he could break and burst the thongs and then go wherever he likes. Now suppose someone said, those stout leather thongs by which this royal tusker elephant is tethered, they are very strong thongs. They're stout, tough, unrotting tethers and a thick yoke. Would that person be speaking rightly? No. Why? Because 
even though they might actually be strong pieces of leather, because the elephant is so powerful, it's very easy just to break those. The elephant can just turn its body and break those. So what is the difference between the elephant and the quail? Is the strength of the animal, right? So even though for the element that they are strong bonds that the elephant is attached to, but because of the elephant's strength, for the elephant, it's not a problem to break those. But for the quail, even though it's a very weak, it's a, just an old vine, the quail can't break it because it's a weak animal. So we should understand, we should examine our own mind actually, and try to determine for us, what things are difficult to practice in the Buddhist teaching? What precepts are difficult for us to practice? In terms of virtue, the Buddha is basically speaking about virtue here. So for one person, it may be difficult on the poi day to abstain from listening to music. For another person, giving up music isn't very difficult, but giving up the evening meal, giving up having dinner is very difficult. So it can be different for each person. And so the elephant, because it's a very strong animal, can quickly break those leather straps. So in the same way, there are some monks who even when the Buddha tells them, abandon this, abandon such a thing, don't do such a deed, they think it's a very small thing and they quickly abandon it. And then they live happily by abandoning what the Buddha tells them to abandon. Now, here the Buddha gives another simile, this pretty funny simile. Suppose Udayin, there were a poor, penniless, destitute man, and he had one dilapidated hovel open to the crows, not the best kind, and one dilapidated wicker bedstead, not the best kind, and some grain and pumpkin seeds in a pot, not the best kind, a very poor man, one hag of a wife, not the best kind, who's not a beautiful woman, he might see a monk in a monastery, monastery park, sitting in the shade of a tree, his hands and feet well washed, after he had eaten a delicious meal, devoting himself to the higher mind. He's practicing meditation in a monastery, maybe under a tree. So this poor man who has uh, very low quality goods in his house, he's, he has some grain and, a, and pumpkin seeds in a pot, that's his food. He's married, but he doesn't have a beautiful wife. He sees this monk sitting there meditating and he thinks to himself, how pleasant the recluse's state is, how pleasant a monk's life is, how healthy the monk's life is. If only I could shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. So he wants to become a monk, actually. He sees the happiness that a monk is experiencing compared to his own life. He a lot of suffering, actually, right, this poor man. But being unable to abandon his one dilapidated hovel open to the crows, maybe is not even completely roofed his house. We could think of maybe some like poor people living in slums in India. And his one dilapidated wicker bedstead, not the best kind, and his grain and pumpkin seeds in a pot, not the best kind. There's the Buddha says after all these, not the best kind and his hag of a wife, not the best kind, he is unable to shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home lice into homelessness. So actually what he's attached to are very minor things, right? He's attached to low quality, central pleasures. This poor man. But what happens to him? even though they're low quality things that he's attached to, for him that attachment is very strong. So even though he sees a monk enjoying the happiness of a monk's life, 
just peacefully meditating. Even though he sees that and wants to become a monk, he can't let go of his minor attachments. So he's like the quail. He has a weak mind like the quail is a weak animal. So in the same way, there are monks who, when they're advised by the Buddha about some minor matter, maybe, they don't want to let that go. They can't give up their actions and follow the Buddha's advice. But then there's another kind of person is also very telling simile. Suppose Udain, there were a rich householder or householder's son with great wealth and property, with a vast number of gold ingots, a vast number of granaries, a vast number of fields, a vast amount of land, a vast number of wives, and a vast number of men and women slaves. He might see a monk in a monastery park sitting in the shade of a tree, his hands and feet well washed after he had eaten a delicious meal, devoting himself to the higher mind, practicing meditation, samadhi. So who sees this? A man who's very wealthy, who has a lot of high quality possessions. In those time in India, people had even multiple wives, a lot of gold, a lot of green, very wealthy person, maybe by today's standards, like a millionaire or something. But I remember there's a, there was a monk who, he's the son of a billionaire, actually, one of the wealthiest people in the world, and he renounced the household life. So he's, he understood the happiness of a monk, and he abandoned, even though he was heir, to his father's billion dollar fortune, right? He abandoned that. So even though he has all these very high quality possessions, his attachment to that is very little, right? So he's able, even though he has all of these possessions, he's able to shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. So those that attachment for him is a very minor thing, actually. So he's like the elephant, very powerful animal, can easily break very strong leather straps because it's a powerful, huge animal. So in the same way, a person can have a strong mind, is able to quickly let go of attachment. I gave you the example about the, the billionaire son. So what kind of Possessions must he have had? What kind of wealth, right? To enjoy whatever he wanted. But I read a little bit about him. He, I think he did a temporary ordination as a monk in Thailand. And he thought it was so wonderful that he wanted to continue. Maybe some of you know about him. He's the a son of a Malaysian billionaire. So we can understand the the reality of the simile, right? So even in the Buddha's time, when the Buddha is teaching them, when there are arahants, a poor man who has maybe the lowest quality possessions, he can't give up the household life and become a monk, even though he wants to, even though he sees the benefits of a monk's life, because his attachment is very strong to so those small things, those low quality sensual pleasures, he's very attached to them. But another person, even though he has the highest quality, the nicest things, he can easily let go of them. The difference in their, between their mind, right? So I think before Sangha Bodhimante taught you a sutta that explained the nature of sensual pleasures. Now, sensual pleasures, one way we can think about them is the pleasant and agreeable objects in the world form, sounds, smells, tastes, and tangible objects. But if that's the case, really, then how is this man able to give all that up? And the poor man isn't. We should understand the Buddha explained, Sankaparago Purisasakamu. So a person's sensual pleasure 
is their lustful intention. So they think in terms of uh, desire, lust for sensual pleasures. So actually, even though this man has a lot of wealth, he's a very rich person, has all these nice possessions, his sensual pleasure is less than the poor man because his sensual desire is lower. Do you understand? So we should understand the sensual pleasure is an internal thing. So if sensual pleasure were just external objects, then how could the Buddha escape from them? How could the Buddha remove sensual desire? The Buddha sees pleasant things. The Buddha hears pleasant sounds. He smells pleasant odors. And he lived in a sandalwood cottage in Savati. The Buddha tastes delicious food. The Buddha feels pleasant tactile objects. But the Buddha doesn't have desire for any of those things. Right? So the desire is an internal thing. So then, again, the Buddha reiterates the simile. There are some monks who, when the Buddha advises them to abandon something, they easily abandon it. And it doesn't become a bond for them in their mind. Now here, the, the discourse changes a bit. Here, Udayin, some person practices the way to the abandoning of the acquisitions to the relinquishing of the acquisitions. Acquisitions are, we can understand fourfold. The acquisitions of the five aggregates, Kandupadi, the acquisitions of volitional formations or Kamma that we create, acquisitions of the defilements of the mind, and acquisitions of sensual pleasures, or our possessions. So a person is practicing to abandon all of that. Abandon the five aggregates affected by clinging. Abandon all mental defilements. Abandon sensual pleasures and one's possessions. And abandon uh, come, which leads to rebirth in next life. But when he's practicing in such a way, maybe let's say practicing Noble Eightfold Path to remove all these things, Memories and intentions associated with all of that, associated with the defilements, associated with sensual pleasures, associated with karma, he tolerates them, he does not abandon them, remove them, do away with them, and annihilate them. Such a person I call fettered, not unfettered. Why is that? Because I have known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. So then there's another kind of person who is practicing in the same way to remove these defilements, to remove the propensity to create karma in the mind. But memories and intentions associated with defilements, associated with karma, arise in his mind. But he doesn't tolerate them. He doesn't accept them when they arise in his mind. And he removes them and annihilates them. But even still, such a person has a fetter in their mind. They have a bond in their mind. Another person is practicing the way to abandon the acquisitions, to relinquish them. And when he is practicing this way, memories and intentions associated with the acquisitions beset him now and then through lapses of mindfulness. I think maybe two or three weeks ago, a question was asked related to this about how defilements, how to recognize when certain defilements are arising in the mind, how to test oneself. So defilements arise in the mind, but this person, they arise in the mind because of lapses of mindfulness. So by not being mindful, unwholesome thoughts can arise in the mind. But even though his mindfulness may be slow and arising, he quickly abandons them, removes them, does away with them, and annihilates them. So maybe because we're not being mindful, we can uh, 
uh, be thinking angry thoughts for some time, for several minutes, maybe half an hour. We're angry, we're thinking angry thoughts. But eventually we can realize, oh, these are unwholesome thoughts, actually. This leads to my own suffering. This leads to the suffering of other people. This creates bad karma, right? So initially they didn't have enough mindfulness to see that. But after some time, their mindfulness arises and they quickly abandon those unwholesome thoughts. Buddha gives a simile for this, just as if a man were to let two or three drops of water fall onto an iron plate heated for the whole day. The falling of the water drops might be slow, but they would quickly vaporize and vanish. So too, here some person is practicing the way to abandon the defilements, abandon karma, but his mindfulness is slow. When his mindfulness eventually does arise, then he quickly abandons all those unwholesome states. But even still, such a person, the Buddha calls fettered. The Buddha has, the Buddha considers this person someone who's fettered in mind. But then another person, having understood that acquisition is the root of suffering, here the Buddha is explaining the cause of suffering to be, we can say, the defilements of mind, karma that leads to rebirth. Having known that that is the root of suffering, he divests himself of the acquisitions and is liberated in the destruction of the acquisitions. So this is an arahant, actually. He's removed all mental defilements. Who creates no more karma that leads to rebirth in the next life. Such a person I call unfettered, not fettered. Why is that? because I have known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. Now the Buddha goes on to explain, by explaining the beginning of the discourse, there is happiness connected with wholesome states and happiness connected with unwholesome states, right? So it's possible to gain happiness by enjoying sensual pleasures. It's also possible to gain happiness by um, practicing generosity, practicing virtue, practicing meditation, right? So the Buddha says, there are Udain, five cords of central pleasure. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. So too the same with sounds, flavors, tangibles, and sounds, flavors, and tangibles. They are agreeable, likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. These are the five objects of sensual pleasure. Now, Udain, the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five objects of sensual pleasure is called sensual pleasure, a filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ignoble pleasure, Remember, the Buddha is teaching this to monks. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should not be pursued, that it should not be developed, that it should not be cultivated, that it should be feared. So a person maybe can see this danger in central pleasure, but if they don't practice properly, they can fall into another extreme. Can anyone, anyone have any idea what the other extreme might be? So instead of gaining happiness by sensual pleasure, a person can do something else. Maybe they're trying to free themselves from sensual pleasure. Anyone have any idea? He will become intoxicated by that one thing. Uh, no, so say a person, say a person wants to abandon that. They want to abandon sensual pleasure. Think about Prince Siddhartha when he left the palace. He abandoned all of his uh, royal pleasures, right? But then what happened to him? He fell into the extreme of self-mortification. 
right? So then he started tormenting his body for six years, fasting, um, reducing his food intake, not bathing, going naked, bathing in cold water. So he's inflicting pain on his body. So that's the other extreme, right? So without understanding the Buddhist teaching properly, a person can fall into that extreme. That's why the Buddha said in his first discourse, the Dhamma Chakka Bhavatana Sutta, these two extremes should not be pursued by a monk. Indulgence and sensual pleasure and self-mortification. Instead of going towards both extremes, you should practice the Noble Eightfold Path, the middle way. So instead of pursuing central pleasure, now one of the reasons why I chose the sutta, so the day after tomorrow you'll be practicing the eight precepts. So in practicing the eight precepts, you distance yourself from central pleasure. So a person can think that they're losing a kind of happiness by doing that. But there's another kind of happiness that we should try to practice, spiritual happiness. So then the Buddha explains the spiritual happiness. He explains quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana. Then he enters the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana. This is called the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should be pursued, that it should be developed, that it should be cultivated, that it should not be feared. Now, this is very important. Um, some people, when uh, you may have heard Dhamma talks or people explain this idea that like you shouldn't practice samadhi, you shouldn't practice jhana, because you can get attached to that. So there are some people criticize that, actually, in the Buddha's teaching. But when we read this discourse, that doesn't agree with the Buddha's teaching, actually. So the Buddha says you should cultivate this. You should practice this kind of happiness. You should practice samadhi and gain the jhanas. It is, after all, part of the Noble Eightfold Path, right? So if we reject that, some people, when they talk about vipassana, inside meditation, they reject the jhanas, practicing the jhanas. But we can understand, actually, from the Buddha's discourses, from the Noble Eightfold Path, that they are rejecting something that the Buddha praised. So that is wrong, actually. So you should understand that that's a wrong view. It's taught in the world today in the name of the Buddha's teaching. But this sutta is very clear that the Buddha praises the practice of John and praises the practice of Samadhi. It should not be feared, it should be cultivated. The Buddha even referred to the states of John as temporary liberation. So liberation is freedom from all, from the suffering of sansara right? Attainment of Nibbana. So to become temporarily freed from defilements, a person can practice Samadhi and gain a profound sense of happiness from that. And as we explained before, the basis for that is the practice of virtue. So we should be very respectful toward virtue. We should have a lot of respect and faith in virtue. We should try to purify our precepts as much as possible, because that will lead to further mental development. So now the Buddha explains the first, second, and third jhana. The Buddha explains they're called perturbable. But then when a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has purified equanimity, which has no pleasure and pain, 
that is imperturbable, the Buddha explains. Now, remember the theme of this discourse that the Buddha was explaining when he advises the monks to abandon something, to give up some kind of action, maybe eating at night, right? When the Buddha advises them to do that, there are some monks who, even though it's a small thing, they don't want to give that up. And there are other monks who, even though it's a small thing, they think that they should give it up because they're respect for the Buddha. So here the Buddha explains, not small things actually, but so even the first jhana, a monk attains the first jhana, the Buddha says, that is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? He gains the second jhana. The Buddha says to abandon that too. These aren't small things anymore, right? This isn't just eating in the evening. These are profound states of meditative concentration. But the Buddha says to abandon that, go further than that. So the Buddha always, we can understand when practicing the path, when developing wholesome qualities, if we decline, that's not progress, right? We have some good quality and we decline in that. Maybe our virtue is pure, but after some time, we begin to tell small lies. That's a decline in the practice, right? Maybe we don't decline and we just stay the same. Buddha doesn't praise that. We don't develop and we don't decline. We just stay the same in our good quality. Buddha doesn't praise that. So how could he... So what to say about decline? The Buddha praises only development, only development of wholesome qualities, development of the path. So all the time, we should try to improve ourselves. We should try to improve in the practice, not be content with where we are. That's the way we can really gain benefits in the Dhamma. That is the way to practice to ultimately realize the Dhamma. If we are content with where we are now, then we won't go further, right? So you shouldn't just be happy with the five precepts. You should want to practice the eight precepts at least once a month. Right? You should try to figure out ways where you can improve your practice in your life. So then a monk attains the second jhana, Buddha tells him to abandon that. That's not enough. He attains the third jhana, the fourth jhana. Buddha tells him to abandon the lower state and attain a higher state of concentration. And the monk attains in this way all four of the formless attainments as well. And even that, the Buddha says, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. So what surmounts it? Here, Udayin, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a monk enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling. That surmounts it. Thus I speak of the abandoning, even of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. So that is the highest state of samadhi, highest of the eight meditative attainments that the Buddha explained. But he says you should abandon even that. Abandon in the sense of go higher than that. Now, the last line of the sutta, the Buddha gives some very beautiful advice. Do you see, Udain, any fetter, small or great, of whose abandoning I do not speak? No, Venerable Sir. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Udain was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So any fetter of the mind, any bondage of the mind, the Buddha says to abandon all of them, every single one. That is the Buddha's target, right? So that target is none other than arahantship, nibbana, right? Anupadaya parinibhayati. So to attain nibbana without clinging to anything in the world. That is the Buddha's goal. 
So we may be very far away from that, and that's okay. But from where we are, we should try to understand in our own mind, what are the difficult things for us to practice in the Dhamma? What are our faults? We need to investigate ourselves. Other people aren't going to tell us most of the time. We should investigate our own mind and see what precepts am I keeping well? What precepts am I maybe breaking habitually? Is my speech purified? Do I tell lies, speak divisive words? Do I speak harshly? Do I speak idle chatter, meaningless words? We should investigate our own lives, our own actions. And we should begin by trying to practice exactly as the Buddha teaches, to abandon those things he teaches us to abandon. So it's not easy, of course. Even in the Buddha's time, there were monks who didn't accept the Buddha's advice right away. So it, it might be very difficult, but we should try to develop our faith in the Buddha and little by little, step by step, move toward that goal. So even if we're progressing slowly, any progress is development, right? The simile of the tortoise and the hare, right? So the tortoise wins the race, not the hare. So that's the end of the discourse today. I think it's a, it's very nice the way that's like gradually progressive in the discourse. From Sila, then the Buddha explains um, sensual pleasures. So as I said before, to attain states of samadhi, you have to distance yourself from sensual pleasures. So during the Poya Day programs, that is your opportunity to try to develop more in meditation because you are deliberately withdrawing yourself from sensual pleasures. I, I think, is the monastery still closed? Are still closed, right? Oh, sorry, Bhante. Um, yes, closed for the programs, but devotees can come to the stupa and worship the stupa. Oh. Can they go inside the meditation hall? Um, no, nowadays not really, mm. Bhante. Only outside in the stupa yeah. compound. Yes. So it's, it's difficult with the the situation these days with the pandemic. Otherwise, you'd be able to go to the monastery like before. And you're in a new environment, right? You're in an environment that's not um, connected with central pleasures. Whereas your environment in the home is different, right? So to be able to go to the monastery and practice for the program during that day is an opportunity for you to distance yourself from central pleasures in that way. But you can still do it at home. I would encourage all of you, if you haven't already, to try and like set up a separate room for yourself if you have space, like a room for you to practice the Dhamma, to be alone and meditate, to study the Dhamma. If you have the space, that's very helpful for you, I think. It's a new dedicated environment for you. So, does anyone have any questions about what we learned today? Any comments or any questions in general? I think it's a, it's a rare opportunity, especially these days with the um, pandemic in the world to get to associate with monks, to ask questions in the Dhamma because you can't visit the monastery as much as you'd wish. So even to be able to do these programs still, is a blessing, I think. Any questions, comments? Uh, yes, Prasad. So I would like to uh, do a comment too, uh, and. Uh, as I said, in the Pali Sutta, uh, it says about uh, uh, virtues, uh, like Vinaya. 
many uh, uh, it says uh, the ten, 10 things uh, or this 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 last one is as I remember uh, the many uh, assist seal mm -hmm. so anugha anugh anugha Anugaha, yeah, Sila Anugaha, or something like that. So uh, that's the last one it says. And uh, so I just wanted to tell, tell this because uh, uh, it, it just uh, assistance for Sila, but the Sila has to come with them. So uh, Buddha say, uh, as I remember, in there's a sutta called, this is the only sutta I can find this kind of information. This is very, very amazing information. Uh, this is uh, Buddha uses two words for uh, sila. Uh, one is sila maya, other one is sila vahoti. Sila vahoti and sila maya. So, according to my understanding, the, the sila va means you know you're within discipline due to the conditions. Because the conditions are there. So it's like uh, when you have some kind of samaditi, then it then so it may it gives uh, rise to some asanka and then you get some mawaja, some and then why I mean some aji with those four things uh, for sila. Uh, then then person will be sila vahoti because of some aditi. Uh, the other uh, category is sila maya. That means you know you are not yet have that understanding, uh, uh, but you do the precepts to calm your mind to and uh, to reduce the, the sensual pressures so that you can still go to that some of the states to that so uh, and uh, that those two entities i want to tell them i want to add another uh, beautiful sutta to connect these so that is mm. uh, two suttas the one is avijja sutta and uh, other one is remember uh, sati sampajani sutta in uh, Sati Sampajana Sutta, it's, uh, it shows the condition for sila is mm. uh, um, Indriya Samvara, then the yeah. condition for, or the Ahara for Sati Sampajana is, uh, uh, sorry, Indriya Samvara, uh, condition for sila is Indriya Samvara, condition for the Indriya Samvara is Sati Sampajana. For, to get Sati Sampajana, then uh, um, Hiryota, uh, then Ahara for Hiryota is uh, 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 in, sorry, the other way. Uh, the uh, uh, condition for Sila is uh, India Sangara, for condition for India Sangara is Hiryota, or the condition for Hiryota is Sati Sampajanya. So the mm -hmm. Sati Sampajanya. Leads to that means uh, mindfulness, mindfulness, then uh, the fear for fear, and uh, then uh, being ashamed of doing wrong things like unwholesome things. Mm. Then it leads to uh, disciplining of the sense basis. Then it leads to seal. So, so that so that way Buddha appreciates. So that's the I think the state we have to go, starting mm. initially from. Uh, mean, uh, or, or, uh, virtues. So I wanted to add these suttas so that we can think uh, together. Uh, yeah, there are different ways the Buddha explains virtue, right, and the causes for virtue. So I remember the in the Anguttara Nikaya, there are suttas explaining uh, the way you explain. I think that Sati Sampajani Sutta is probably from the Anguttara Nikaya, and yes. the Buddha gives nice similes about how a tree is growing. If it doesn't have enough leaves, then it's not going to grow properly. And so the bark won't grow. The branches won't grow to maturity. But if the tree has enough leaves to begin with, then it can grow properly and mature. In the same way, there are different conditions, causes and conditions we need to develop in our mind in order to progress on the path. Bhante, I have a, yeah. I have a question, Bhante. Um, a few a few weeks ago, I think it was two or three weeks ago, we we discussed intention and non-self, and in that time, uh, from then to now, I've been very much contemplating non-self and intention, and something popped up in me 
uh, as I was doing that is choice. So if there's not a self of me uh, in this very minute, there's probably a thousand things that I could choose as choice. Uh, I could choose to sit here. I could choose to stand. I could choose to sit. I could choose to leave. What? Mm -hmm. If there's no me, no self, what makes the choice? We should understand that the choosing, so that's part of the volitional formations aggregate affected by clinging. Intention? So that, yeah, intention. So that's also an impermanent thing. That's also a condition. So we can understand that in two ways. So think you just simply think your thoughts, right? So you can think about various things, right? Mm -hmm. But are any of those thoughts permanent? No. No, right? So they arise dependent on causes and conditions. Contact, actually, is the cause for those intentions to arise. And when contact changes, the intentions change. So if they're impermanent, then it's not proper to regard them as having a self or is belonging to a self because they're impermanent. There's no permanent essence in them. And it's also, you can think about this way, you have some sense of uh, choice, control over what you're thinking, but can you exercise full mastery over your, your thoughts? No. Sometimes we think things that we don't want to think, right? Right. And we can't let go of the thoughts. That also is another reason why we can understand that the thoughts are not self. Otherwise, we should be able to control them as we wish all the time, 100% of the time. So, so Bhante, one, one more question. So if I'm standing right beside someone else and there's a bank in front of me, I decide not to rob the bank and the other person decides to rob the bank. What is the difference between us two? Well, your thought would be wholesome his thought would be unwholesome. And, and why does he choose unwholesome and why do I choose wholesome? Uh, I don't even well, know if I'll understand the answer. <laughs> well, let's, let's think in this way. So wholesome and unwholesome, the understanding of wholesome and unwholesome is related to wisdom. But... Let me ask you a question in return. So these days, more so than wisdom, now, let me, so I ask you a simple question. So stealing from the bank, let's say you can steal from the bank and get away with it. You wouldn't be caught. But you're also a disciple of the Buddha. So you choose not to steal from the bank. Now, do you not steal from the bank because of your wisdom, understanding that this is an unwholesome deed, this leads to bad consequences for myself and others? Is it because of your wisdom that you abstain from it, or because there's a precept that the Buddha taught? Because of my wisdom. Because of your wisdom? Yes. Because I know it's wrong, and I know that it's not going to benefit me or anybody else. Well, which is if part it, of the precept. If it is because of your wisdom, then that's, that is congratulations to you. But I think most of the time, it would be because there's a precept. So in the beginning of the Buddha's dispensation, the Buddha didn't teach precepts. So the Buddha taught the Dhamma, but he didn't create precepts in the Vinaya in the beginning, I think about 20 years. Why? Because those days, the monks had the wisdom to understand what is wholesome and unwholesome. So they restrained themselves with the wisdom. They restrained themselves with their understanding of the Dhamma. But later, the Buddha instituted, as Prasad said, for 10 reasons, uh, the Buddha instituted precepts. And those established restraints on our actions. It's like a, a boundary a cutoff point that we can't cross. So without that boundary established by the precepts, we would most likely 
um, break the precepts. We would most likely engage in unwholesome actions because I think our wisdom actually isn't isn't as mature as it could be. It definitely isn't mature as mature as it could be. So I think most of the time we would abstain from unwholesome actions because there's a precept. So even though the desire may be there, unwholesome states may be there to engage in those actions, maybe to kill living beings, get angry at ants coming into the house, or to steal, to engage in sexual misconduct, to lie, to um, consume intoxicants. So even though the desire to do those things may be there, the precepts establish a uh, boundary. They restrict our actions. They restrain our actions. So I think in your example, as a disciple of the Buddha, probably the main reason you would abstain from an unwholesome action would be because there's a precept laid down. So let's say, for example, a stream enter a disciple. Do they need to abstain from stealing because there's a precept? Or because they have the wisdom of understanding what's unwholesome, what's wholesome? because they've purified their mind to the extent that they are naturally virtuous. So there's a difference, uh, I, right, between the yeah. stream mentor disciple and the disciple who's just practicing the precepts? I, I understand now. It, it, sort of, it sort of defines the border of what's right and what's wrong, the precept. Mm. Yeah. Without that border, it's difficult because we are, our wisdom is limited. It's difficult for us to discern through our actions what we should do, what we shouldn't do. But the precepts give us very clear guidelines. Thank you, Bhante. Hmm. Uh, so, no, so if, 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 if I say like this, you know, you can comment on this. And uh, uh, this, I, this, this thought came to my mind, you know, uh, as he said, like uh, there, is, there is some sort of wisdom. It's like a mundane. Uh, uh, mundane, uh, some uh, mundane view, mu mundane right view, uh, mm. uh, with the samadhi. So we assess his decision, like you know that, like you know, because he believes in karma, so that yeah, uh, to the action. So that is also wisdom. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Bhante, is it okay if I ask something? Sure, sure. Yeah, so actually I just wanted to uh, to add to uh, what Ray said about um, how you understand, like, you know, there is actually no I, right? The way, I, I think one way, which I actually, uh, I thought of was, um, you can think of it as like a process, right? It's like, you can't, there's no one, it's, it's like, for example, like blood flowing through your veins, right? It's it's a process. It's if you ask like who is doing it, it's not it's not valid, right? So the same way, it's like all the, the like the feelings and everything in your mind, those are and the thoughts and everything. That's all a process. There's no one actually behind that, right? Would would that be uh, a valid way of putting it? Uh, I will give you a discourse where the Buddha teaches in that way. Okay. Have you learned dependent origination? Maybe from Jivananda Bhante? Yes, Bhante. Yes. Yeah. So then you should be able to understand this. Called Moli Apagbuna Sutta. And um, the monk, Venerable Moli Apagbuna was thinking in that way, thinking, so who, do we speak about craving? Do you think, who, who craves? Who does this craving? <laughs> the Buddha said it's not, it's not a valid question. It's not proper to think in that way. So to say who craves, who feels this painful feeling from the concussion, it's thinking in terms of the self, right? Was thinking within Sakkai Ditti, within the view of the self. So 
instead of thinking in that way, the Buddha teaches to think in terms of causes and conditions. So feeling is an impermanent thing. It arises because of contact. It ceases with the cessation of contact. Now, this is very simple to say, but to actually to gain a realization about this is to gain a realization about impermanence, to gain a realization about suffering, to gain a realization about non-self. It's not a small thing, actually, this, to think in terms of conditionality, causes and conditions. To really train the mind to do that, that leads to realization. In I see, I see. And uh, that's actually another question, Bhante. So I, I've seen um, it's it's not it, it's it's like a, it, it's it's a Buddha it's a Buddha it's a Buddha quote, right? But it's I don't think like it's it's exactly word for word by the Buddha, right? But it's it goes something like this, right? Um, basically, the whole world is in your mind, right? So I I can see how it's like how they come up with that, right? But is there like a direct reference in the suttas? for that because like if you actually think about it you can actually think that okay the past the future it's all just thoughts really right and really when you're saying you're, you desire something or you dislike something you are actually desiring or disliking your own thoughts right so if you actually think about it it makes sense right you're actually just clinging to your own thoughts at the end of the day right is there any any reference to this in the suttas uh... I think of two. So the first two verses in Dhammapada, mm -hmm. right? That you can get some information from that. Manupu Bangama Dhamma, Manu Sitta Manomaya. Mind is the forerunner of all, all states. Mind is the chief. Now they are mind made. So if you speak or act with a pure mind, then happiness will follow you like a never departing shadow but if you speak or act with an impure mind then suffering follows you like the wheel that follows the ox cart another way we can understand is, is very deep um, Buddha said manasikara sambhava sabbe dhamma sabbe dhamma pasta samudaya so all, all things arise through attention. Sambhi Dhamma Pasasamudaya. All things originate from contact. So I don't think I have time to explain that in detail today. That's a very deep, deep point actually. Um, but I think you can read the sutta for that. Look, uh, trying to remember the English translation for that. I think in uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's English translation, so I'll just give you the Pali name of the sutta and you can try to find it in Anguttara Nikaya. Bhante, when you say when you when you say the first part, are you saying that whatever you put out there attracts you? So if you put out goodness and kindness, goodness and kindness comes back to you. Is that sort of what? Well, by practicing loving kindness meditation, you'll definitely receive a pleasant result from that as good karma. So there's no way at all. It's not possible. It's impossible that by practicing loving kindness, you will experience suffering from them. So you definitely experience some happiness as a result of that karma. And if you, for example, if you kill a living being, you'll definitely experience suffering from that. It's impossible that you'll experience happiness from them as a result of the karma. The second, the second point about the origination of attention. So, intention is part of nama rupa. Attention, not intention. Attention is part of nama rupa. 
Have you all read the Mahahati Badokma Sutta? The Discourse on the Greater Simile of the Elephant's Footprint. In that discourse, Arahant Sariputta explains the role of attention, Manasikara. So our attention changes the... Attention is one of the main factors that cause the arising of the sense spaces. So to give you an example, in school a little a child is not paying attention to what his teacher is teaching and he's daydreaming about something. So even though someone's speaking to him, speaking his name, the teacher is talking to him, he doesn't hear her. Why? Because he's daydreaming. His attention is focused in the mind. His attention is associated with another sense base. Even though someone's speaking, he doesn't hear. So there's, so the the sense bases arise, um, conditioned by attention. You can think about that more on your on your own. <laughs> Ponder that and read that discourse if you have time. To, Majjhimunikaya 28, I think, the discourse on the greater simile of the elephant's footprint. It's a very profound discourse, actually. It goes through the Four Noble Truths, it explains the four elements, it explains the six sense bases, the five aggregates of clinging. Very profound sutta. And actually, Bhante, now, what's, what's the difference between like the vinyana? And the attention, because for example, like in the in the example you said, like if you're if you're paying if you're not paying attention to something, you can also say that the vinyana wasn't pointed towards whatever that was, right? So another way, like the way I think of it, is the vinyana is just the attention. Is that is that incorrect? Well, there are different words in Pali, and we can say they're the same thing. Because Namarupa is the condition for Vinyan and Vinyan is the condition for Namarupa. So attention is included in Namarupa. So attention is one of the causes for the arising of consciousness. So we can't say that they're the same thing. Um, yeah, that's, that's the sutta. Thank you, uh, Renga. Um, Read, read, the Sutta. read the uh, Mahahati Badokma Sutta and I think you'll be able to understand more. And there's the simile in the, in the Malinda Panya about the five aggregates affected by clinging where waters from the five great rivers in India come together and then the place where they meet to try and separate and say this is the water from the Ganges River. This is the water from the Mahi River. This is the water from the Sarabu River. <laughs> Very difficult thing to do, right? So that is what the Buddha has done in analyzing the five aggregates affected by clinging. Because they all exist together. I see. And uh, it's just a very difficult yeah, thing to see. Difficult and... to, yeah. Yeah, because to me, like I was just thinking, like you know, the vinyan is just the attention. That's how I was thinking it all along. No, it's I like, for example, think again, right? don't think because the thing is, like I was thinking, like for example, like let's say, like you're walking on the road, right, and then like a nice sports car goes by, right? You see the sports car, you notice the sports car, right? But you also like your eye also sees uh, like the background imagery, everything around, right? But you don't have thoughts based on what was behind that or anything else. You just have thoughts on the sports car, for example, right? So, at that, like that's that's how I was analyzing it, and then I, I came to the conclusion that the, the vinyan is probably just attention. So I don't know. Maybe 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 it's, it's explain vinyan. So in I think what upadana parivartana sutta maybe where the Buddha well no kajani is it, I think. Where the Buddha explains why the five aggregates affected by clinging are, are named uh, such. 
So Prasad explained why Vedana's name Vedana Vedeti, because it feels. And then explain what would explain what does it feel? Feels pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neutral feeling. So try and read the Buddha's definitions and uh, understand according to that. And Bhante, can you please repeat the name of that sutta? Prajaniya Sutta. And uh, Kajaniya Sutta. Samyutta Nikaya. Being devoured. Being devoured. Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Okay. Hmm. All right. And uh, just one more question, Bhante. Um, now, Bhante mentioned uh, about the, the five precepts, right? How it's it's related to I mean it doesn't always have to be related to faith, does it? Like like it does like it, it can be either faith or it can also be wisdom, but I'm thinking like it can also be done through through logic, right? Like you can logically reason out why keeping the five precepts is the better way to go. Right. And actually there's one there's one sutta I found actually about that, which it doesn't rely on faith at all. Right. Um, it's called uh, here. I'll send the link. I think it's called Velu Dware Sutta. Right. So I just I just know, thought I. Yeah, I just just thought I'd share that with you. Just trying to find it right here. The Buddha teaches in different ways according to different inclinations, mm -hmm. but a person can also logically reason out why they shouldn't practice the five precepts. What? Why they should? People, people who are immoral, maybe nihilists. It is. They can also logically reason out why they shouldn't break it. Twice. Yeah, but the thing is, if if they, yeah, the thing is though, th this sutta basically, which I'm I'm sending now, it says it puts you in the position. So even the people who don't believe that, like like when they're put in the position, everything changes. The tables turn. Right. So like they they contradict what they're like they they contradict what they're saying. Right. Mm -hmm. So actually that's that's what this sutta says here. Right. So I just thought I'd share that with, with everyone. Okay, and let me yeah, let me also yeah. just uh, share that other one. And this is the Kajaniya Sutta. I, I couldn't find Bhikkhu Bodhi's one, but I found uh Tanisaru Bhikkhu's one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's all Bhante. Sadhu Sadhu. So I think we went over the time. I don't know if it was inconvenient for everyone or anyone. Uh, I was happy to continue answering questions. <laughs> if there are no more questions, I think um, so you'll have the full moon program day after tomorrow. You can get a chance to ask questions during that. And... Um, Try to practice what we learned today about reflecting on one's fault and being able to accept the Buddha's advice faithfully, even though it might be a small thing that the Buddha is telling us to practice, small thing that the Buddha is telling us to give up. But depending on our own defilements, our own strength of mind, it may be easy or difficult to give those things up. Right, so it can be different from person to person. But the faithful disciple of the Buddha, even if it's difficult, should practice to uh, give up what the Buddha says to give up, to develop what the Buddha says to develop, and to practice in such a way that conforms with the Buddha's advice, right? So whether a monk or a lay person that is the right way to practice in the Buddha's time there were uh, there were monks who didn't accept the Buddha's advice right away and I think surely there must have been lay people as well even though it's not easy to accept the Buddha's advice and to practice it that will surely lead to our well-being in this life and the next why? Because the Buddha is fully enlightened. The Buddha knows the knows wholesome qualities, knows unwholesome qualities. Buddha has the wisdom about that. Buddha realized that. 
So surely, if we practice according to the Buddha's teaching, we will gain the benefits. 